Hello and welcome to Socially Holistic Podcast. Socially Holistic helps coaches and holistic entrepreneurs and women in heart-centered businesses make sense of social media so they can build their own online network and get more clients. As a heart-centered business owner, you do amazing work. Holly's mission in life is to help you help more people. Help us help more women in business with a five-star review of this podcast. Please leave one today over at iTunes. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more heart-centered businesses will be successful. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Socially Holistic Podcast, episode 51. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm here with today's very special guest, Natalie Sisson from The Suitcase Entrepreneur. Natalie is a business coach and mentor who teaches how to have freedom in business and adventure in life. Welcome, Natalie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you today because you were, of course, the inspiration for my own podcast. (laughs) I know. I'm so excited and how much it's grown as well. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, Why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about your background and what it is that you do? Uh, What do I do? I sell freedom. (laughs) (laughs) It's my way that I start launching off these days. So I am officially my own brand these days. I guess I am a a mediapreneur and I've built a business around my brand, the brand being the suitcase entrepreneur. So my highest value in life is, is freedom. And I've always wanted to be able to do what I want, when I want, from where I want. And I, about... Five years ago, I left the corporate world. I'd been in the corporate world for about eight years doing marketing and branding and business development. And I took off to Canada to play some world championship ultimate frisbee and also on the proviso that I would start my own business, which I had no idea really what it was going to be, but I just didn't want to work for anybody else anymore. Uh, Instead, I started a technology company. I co-founded it with my business partner and we went ahead and built actually a Facebook fundraising application. So it was like 18 months of getting to know whirlwind how do you start a tech company how do you build a piece of software how do you build it on a platform that's continually changing as we all know um how do you get people to trust and handing over payments on facebook which at the time was this is like 2000 and late 2008 where people were like hell no i'm not going to hand over any payments on facebook so it was a really fascinating time and a huge area for me was not just getting investors on board in the financial model and building out the software it was actually marketing it with zero budget on social media. So that's kind of where a lot of my time and energy went. How do you build a user base from scratch? And during that time, I was just so fascinated with the whole process and how much I was learning. Like this was a huge learning curve after being in the corporate world that I started blogging. And that blog today is what my entire business has been built on. So I quit the business that we built about 18 months after my blog was way more exciting to me. My business partner said, I think it's great. You're so passionate about it. Why don't you turn it into a business? And I was like, great idea. Um, But nobody, you know, I didn't really think how hard it is to turn a blog into a business. And I don't advise it for everybody. But ultimately, what I think I did instead was build a lot of trust and credibility and my expertise and knowledge and package that into products and services and books and workshops and speaking and membership sites. And that's basically what I do today. Excellent. So can you tell us a little bit about what were those challenges that came when you shifted from just simply blogging to turning your blog into a business? That is probably the key factor right there that you just mentioned. So for a long time I had this blog, but I didn't really take it seriously or myself. I mean, I took it seriously because I was like, oh, this is going to be my business. But I think deep down I hadn't really considered all the things I needed to do to make sure that was going to be a business and how I was going to monetize that. So I think for me it was a mindset shift to really take it seriously, and that didn't happen straight away. And part of that was self-belief, right? It's Mm. a new area, and I was like, well, who am I to blog, and and who am I to kind of share my information and knowledge, and who's actually really listening, and and why should they trust me? So it was a, a big area of getting over myself and realizing that even with a small amount of knowledge, if it was a little bit more than the person who was following me, it was going to be really valuable and useful to them. So the first thing was self-belief, and the second thing was actually going, this is serious, and I'm going to treat it that way, rather than a hobby or a casual blog where you just update it every so often. You don't consider all the things that you need to learn and do to make it work really well and be super popular. Mm, Excellent. And was there a tipping point in your business where things went from just struggling to make it happen to shifting into flow? Yeah. Somebody was asking me the other day, I think it honestly took, 
you know, like a year and a half to two years, to be quite honest. I, even though I was earning money, I'd launched, um, I'd done a social media boot camp workshop that had sold out three times. And then I took that and I turned it into an online program and I hit the road and went to Argentina. But I think it was a good year, year and a half before I actually felt comfortable saying, this is a business and it's legitimate and I'm earning money. And even a year after that, there's still been times where I'm like, oh, okay, now it's consistent. So it takes a lot longer than you think, Mm -hmm. uh, not to make money, but even if you're doing all the right things, which I think I definitely was, it just takes a lot longer than you think. So I'd say the tipping point was when I'd launched three products, actually, and the third one had been more successful and I'd implemented everything that I'd learned from the first two, which were fine but not brilliant that's when I started to feel more secure, I guess, and confident in my abilities. That's when I started getting more coaching clients. And that's when the blog started getting more popular. Mm, Excellent. And I think the amazing thing about your business is that you do not have a fixed base. You travel all over the world. You document this on your blog and your website, and you're constantly traveling. So how, how has that become a major part of your business? Well, it's funny, actually, Holly, because I didn't expect it to. And there's no need for me to be the suitcase entrepreneur. You know, I just wanted to show people how you can live from anywhere, live and work from anywhere. And I would also say probably 50 to 60% of my audience have no desire to travel uh, and no desire to travel as much as I do or live in a suitcase. It's not that feeling for everybody. But it just interestingly became something I thought, you know, if I'm living and breathing this, I'm far more able to speak about the realities of it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And for me, it also was, as I said at the beginning, something that I really wanted to work towards, the ability to run my business from anywhere. I just didn't think that it would take on such a life of its own and become something that I'm kind of renowned for now. And it's going to be interesting when I shift out of living and working all the time out of my suitcase and having no home and no base. It's going to be interesting to see how I morph. Somebody was like, are you going to become the home entrepreneur or the (laughs) the semi-settled entrepreneur? I was like, no. (laughs) Yeah, but it's a really great question. I think it's helped build a lot of the authenticity behind the brand, a lot of credibility because there's not that many women um, who are traveling and running a successful business from their suitcase. There's a lot of guys. So it's Mm. good to be that, that singular, well, not singular, but, you know, one of the rare voices out there who's, a lifestyle entrepreneur, as you want to call it, or a digital nomad, and really living and breathing that. Mm. And how long have you been on the road? This is year four, so actually it's about three and a half years, coming up to four years full time. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And about how long do you stay in each place, just for our listeners who may not know? Well, I'd love to say there was some sort of agenda to that, but there's not. So initially when I started, I'd spend, for example, I spent five months in Argentina and I rented an apartment, and then I spent two months in Amsterdam and then two months in Berlin, and then it kind of diminished from there. So sometimes it's a couple of days and other times it's a week and sometimes it's a month. But the most I've stayed anywhere for the last two years is under two months, Mm. Um, which is a little bit crazy and something that I'm going to slow down because it certainly starts to take its toll. Uh, And my travel is usually based around, is there a conference or an event that I want to go to? Are there friends of mine in the country? Is it a country I've never been to before? Or is there an ultimate Frisbee tournament going on, which is my love? And if it's all of those things, then I'm definitely going there. But it's been driven a lot recently by work and places of interest. So I'm kind of just open to jumping all over the place, which doesn't always work that well. And I love how you've also built your travel into your business because you've got your Build Your Online Business workshops. And this year you're running them in several different locations all over the world. Isn't that right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it made a lot more sense. I was like, if I'm going to these cities and I can give people enough advance notice, let's see if my target market's there. Let's see if my community is there. And if they want to take part in this workshop, which has been awesome, then I'll hold it. And so, you know, I ran one in Tokyo and I had no idea who would come along to it. Didn't even think I had an audience there. I had two people come over from China, American, but they came over from China for it. And then a couple of weeks later, I was staying in Kyoto, which is a beautiful part of Japan. And there were five people there who were realized that I'd come there and said, would, would you mind holding one here? There's five of us and we're ready to go. And I was like, sure. <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Spontaneous workshop. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And I think one of the big shifts in your business last year, at least from an outsider's perspective, was when you published your book. Mm-hmm. How has that changed your business, having published a book? It's good to hear that it's an outside shift. It's changed it a lot, obviously. A book is just basically a license to give you a lot more credibility. Even even I self-published my book, and it did become a number one bestseller on Amazon. Um, but 
even just having a book really helps you to define and say, yeah, you know, I'm a published author. There's something about books that still gets people. If you think about all the interviews people do online and that I see, it's always with published authors. So it's really helped. I think more importantly for me, it just helps solidify and clarify exactly what I do and who I serve. And writing that into a book, you know, over the space of several months is there's no stronger and more powerful way for you to really capture all your knowledge and condense it into something that's really valuable and useful. Uh, outside of that, it helped massively in terms of audience. I ran a 30-day blog challenge at the same time as the book went out, which was probably not advisable. It was a lot of work, but it was incredible because I got thousands doing that challenge, and the challenge was based around the book, so it really helped to sell a lot more books. Since then, I've gone on to get lots of speaking gigs, lots of media attention and articles as a result of it, and it's just grown my community a lot. And I think also it has given a lot more, how do I say what's the word? There's just a lot more fans who really buy into it now because mm. they read the book and they've been part of it. So that's a really beautiful thing. Mm, that's excellent. I was going to ask you about your press coverage. You've got a lot of really spectacular press coverage in the last year. Do you think that's a result, of, direct result of your book? It's a part of the result. I would say some of it also has been through networks and connections and people who have just suggested me or mentioned me to these major outlets. So, for example, the Yahoo Finance, which was massive, as you say, still get traffic from that and sign-ups. It's incredible. But that was through a connection who said, yep, I know the perfect person for the type of story that you're trying to run. And so that was amazing. They flew me out to New York to shoot that, that video and put me on the homepage of Yahoo Finance. Uh, that was definitely more a connection. Other ones have just been outreach and then definitely the brand, I guess, gaining more prominence. Mm -hmm. So some of it's been self-induced, some of it's from the book, and then some has just been great, you know, fortunate networks and relationships that I've built over the years. And I imagine that traveling all around the world, your network is built in a very international way, obviously, because you're meeting people all over the world in addition to the online marketing that you're doing. Exactly. Hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about your offerings? Because you've got a number of different things. You've got coaching, you've got retreats, you've got workshops, you've got your High Flyer Club, which is a mentoring program. Yes. How did all of this come about? Because you've got a number of things, and obviously you didn't launch everything at once. It came little by little. Exactly. Um, it's funny. I think I have eight revenue streams, and apparently millionaires have seven, so I don't know what that says for me. It means either there's too many or I'm going to become a billionaire. Uh, <laughs> not my desire, by the way. Uh, so, yeah, they came about slowly and surely, and also by listening to my community. So I started with the digital launch of my social media boot camp, as I mentioned, because people were asking me about it. So that went quite well. Then I created, you know, I really listened to what people were struggling with, but also my strengths. And I'm a big one for using tools and social media and outsourcing. So I created a toolkit and that went really, really well. From there, I then actually ran a blog series called Why Would Be Build Your Online Business. And that eventually turned into the guide, which turned into a series of guides, which turned into this workshop, which will turn into a program. So it's always just like listening, listening, listening. What are people struggling with? What are they having challenges with within my niche within my industry and then creating solutions for them. I also did coaching early on because I needed some immediate revenue coming in and I also had a few people ask me about it and so that was a good test for me to say you know I really felt that I could help a lot of people but that was really helpful to put that out because digital products and programs require a whole back-end marketing strategy behind them and even though they can be on autopilot and keep selling you still have to work really hard to create great content to build your traffic to get more leads to share more of it so you can make more sales, whereas coaching is very much, um, you know, when people sign up for it, you have them, they're captured, you get to work with them intensively, etc. So I liked the different forms of revenue stream because they fitted in with my travels and also what I was planning to do. And then I love workshops because I just love getting to meet people in person and have breakthrough, breakthroughs with them. They're not always feasible with the kind of business that I do, but as you said, I've incorporated it into my travels this year. And then everything else has kind of come on from there. So my High Flyer Club I introduced at the end of last year for two reasons. I didn't have an offering to a, to establish entrepreneurs that I really wanted to work with these people more, people who really had the money to invest in themselves and were going places. And also I was really keen to have a recurring revenue model rather than having to rely on you know digital product sales and, and active services. So that was another part and reason for it. And then speaking and the book and various other things have come as a result of just the growth of business and saying yes to the right opportunities.
Mm, excellent. One of the things that you mentioned was that you listened online to what people need. And that's something that I'm constantly telling my own clients because a lot of them just rush out and create something, but they're not actually sure if that's what people need or want or are willing to pay for. So where did you go to listen to people's needs? I actually asked them. So, well, there's a couple of places. One, I'm a huge social media advocate. So I'd hang out in Facebook groups that were relevant to me and i I'd look at what people were posting and what they were asking and I'd help out and I'd answer questions and then I'd be like, hmm, this is coming up consistently. I'd look at the blog comments that I'd get when I'd publish a post about a specific area and see what else people were asking for or what their challenges were. I would do the same on LinkedIn or just basically online. I'd look at what people were talking about regularly and their pain points. And I also am a big fan, probably like you, Holly, of surveying my audience. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I think I used to two or three times a year I put out a short survey using Google Forms or whatever it may be and just or even a poll on Facebook and say, look, which of these areas is most pressing to you or what what challenge are you having right now in business and life? And it's just so insightful how you can get so much information from that. And the final place that I actually think is probably the most genius that I've ever had is is just my simple welcome email when people sign up to my newsletter. I actually just say to them, Hey, please hit reply and tell me about yourself. And initially, for two or three months, I got zero. I was like, oh, that's sad. And then people started actually emailing, going, oh, I just thought I'd hit reply like you asked, and my name's Blah, and I live here, and this is what I do, and oh, I'd really love to be doing more of this, but I can't. And now I get daily emails where people tell me about themselves, their lives, their problems, their challenges. They send photos. I mean, it's incredible. And every single time it happens, it just helps validate that I'm on the right track or who my community members is so that I can really help create more solutions for them. I think that last tip was fantastic because that also kind of cements the relationship a little bit more. It's not just someone signed up for your mailing list and maybe at some point they'll, you know, unsubscribe, but they've now got a relationship with you because they've hit reply, you've been in contact, you've had that one-to-one contact, and I think that probably just makes them a much stronger part of your community as well. Exactly. Mm, Excellent. So what would you say, Natalie, are your top tips for how to build an online business? Well, I have six steps to building a profitable online business, but I'd say (laughs) tips getting really, really clear on your sweet spot, which isn't something that I developed, but I love to talk about it. So the intersection between what you're really good at or what you love, well, sorry, what you're excellent at, what you love doing or what you at least enjoy doing and what people will pay you for. Hmm. So people just say to me, well, I'm pretty good at this and I've got these skills, but I don't really know how I can make money from it. And you need to find that wonderful intersection of where those skills overlap with what you enjoy doing and what people will pay you for. That sounds really simple or maybe it doesn't sound simple, but that's probably the most critical thing. The second thing is to really understand, well, then who is your audience? So I've talked about this a lot, but when I first started, my blog was called Women's World and it was to all women entrepreneurs around the world, which isn't even a niche. So the whole time that I was running that, I was really kind of, I thought I was putting out great stuff, but people weren't really clear on who I was targeting. So they're like, I really like what you're writing, but is it for me? I'm not a woman or I am a woman or et cetera. And it's just because I was not speaking to my specific ideal audience. So the biggest lesson that I think I've learned is to just be absolutely know who you want to be working with. And sometimes that comes over time, but you'll start to see your ideal customer. They're the people who really appreciate you who give you energy, who pay you what you're worth, who are excited about your work, who tell other people about your work, who um, put in the action and get results and really, really, really love what you do and respect it. So you want to work with more of those people and you have to be clear and intentional about where they are and how you're going to target them. And how did you identify your ideal audience within that group? Because I know you, you occasionally start seeing people who love what you do, they're constantly referring you, but how did you define what that group is and what they're about and what they want? I think it's, it's come through many, many conversations over the years. It's come through community members who just light me up with their comments or their feedback. Uh, it's come through also knowing who I don't want to work with. Um, I've been really fortunate to have pretty amazing clients, but every so often you get one or two, and after you've got off a call with them or you've worked with them, you're just like, yeah, that's not somebody I'd like to, that's the type of person that I don't want to work with again. Mm -hmm. So I'm all about people taking action and actually getting results. I can't stand it when people just buy stuff and don't do anything with it, which unfortunately 80% of people often do. So (laughs) my work is all about getting them to take action, getting results, and being really clear on their vision for their life and business, and that 
generally everything that you do and put out radiates the type of person that you are and the type of person that you want to attract. So just by by proxy and doing the work that you do and the brand that you have and the language that you use and the things that you offer, you should be, if you're doing all the right things, attracting your ideal customer. Um, in terms of how I came across it, as I said, it was probably just through many conversations and knowing who I did and didn't want to work with, but also knowing where my strengths lay and what I could best serve people with. You know, I'm maybe not the perfect person for people wanting to do X, Y, Z, and just really knowing where your strengths lie and who you're going to be able to help most. Mm, I think that's really important. That, and I agree with what you say about when you re- really express your personality online, then you'll attract the right people to you. But I find that a lot of women in business, I don't know, it's like they water themselves down and try to appeal to everyone. And of course, that means that they're just not appealing to anyone at all. Exactly. So <laughs> what, what would be your tips for, or how did you manage to just clearly express who you are and what you're about online? I think it's taken a long time, to be honest, and I think it's something that people can consistently come back to and tweak and improve on. So um, I think it took a good year, year and a half to get clear on that, and still even now it's just something that I continually refine because you change as well and what you offer changes and the direction that you go. Um, I, I wrote a book called Am I Your Customer where I go through a series of exercises of how to understand your ideal customer and your profile, and a lot of that has come through once again asking them, interviewing them, sitting down over coffee and asking these questions and getting into their head and really digging deep into the psychology of who they are and what they struggle with. So I've just always listened and tried to understand, once again, who I want to work with, but also who I can help most. Hmm. It's not an easy thing and it doesn't just happen, but it's just being open to really digging into and being curious about people and want to help them as much as you can. That's where you really start to see who the perfect client is. Yeah, I think that natural curiosity that that you have for your ideal clients is just such an important part of business, just getting to know them and wanting to get to know them more and kind of digging in deeper to what it is that they're suffering from. Exactly. Hmm. So, Natalie, do you have any women business mentors? Are there any women in business who inspire you? Uh, Yes, there are. Sorry, just when you said getting to know you, just had that song pop into my head. (laughs) From uh, Sound of Music, when it's like getting to know you, <laughs> getting to know all about you. It's pretty much the same thing, right? That's what you have to do. You have to want to really get to understand and know that person as if they're your best friend sitting across from the table. So anything that you put out, they're just going to go, oh, it's like you're speaking to me. Um, so in terms of women who inspire me, yeah, you know, I've worked a lot in the past with Natalie McNeil. She was my business partner in a mastermind that we ran and she just continually even though she's a very dear friend she also continually impresses me um she's a lot younger than me she's super driven and ambitious and she's also even though she has this massive i want to take on the world attitude she's also really thrown herself into meditation and spirituality in the last year and i love how it's it's given her more depth as a person and i'm super impressed with what she's done with her business and how she thinks about it and she's always you know trying to push further but i also love that she's developed herself um so that's pretty awesome. Uh, there are several people, I guess, that I've had also on my podcast who really inspire me. And, you know, I love Jamie Tardy. She's got a great podcast herself, and book, but she's just an incredible, incredible networker and has this ability to make friendships with complete strangers. And she's super generous with her knowledge and time. And I think she's built a really brilliant business as well. Obviously, you can't help but go past Marie Folio even though I think she's grown kind of beyond excessive now, I really do admire that she has taken on a world which is predominantly male dominated and teaching, you know, online business and absolutely crushed it and got all these people to come along and be her fans and spread the word and built, you know, multiple million dollar empire. So it's really awesome to see that. Um, and outside of that, I guess you can't go past Maya Angelou and you've got old Oprah Winfrey um, and Ariana Huffington, just people who have just bought what they really believed in and built incredible empires and so much influence and power in a way, but used it in a really, really positive way. Mm, Excellent. So, Natalie, how can other women in business benefit from working with you? Say if they wanted to just figure out what is right for them from all of your offerings. Well, coming back to the wonderful avatar point is that um, probably about six months ago, I actually created on my products page this thing is basically helping people to identify who they are. So it says, I'm just starting out in business or I have a side hustle and I'd really like to know how I can further that. Um, the second one is I already have a business and I want to travel the world. 
may need tips and strategies on how to do that, make my business mobile. And then there's, I've got a business, but I'd really like to just enjoy more freedom and have it more systemized. So I've really understood who my audience are. There's the people who don't want to travel and the people who do and the people who are more advanced and those just starting out. So within that, I've actually then selected products and services that are right for them at their stage of business. Excellent. So uh, just head over to your website and click yeah. on the option. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If they go to suitcaseentrepreneur.com forward slash shop, they'll actually get that, that landing page where it helps them self-identify. And then within that, I've done a really, you know, I hope that I've really understood where they're coming from and customized for them what might be really useful for them to get ahead or to start reading or start doing. Excellent. So, uh, yeah. Excellent. And you also have, if people sign up to your list, a free suitcase starter kit. Yes, it's could, very cool. <laughs> could you tell us a little bit about that? Because that's quite a little package. It's not that's just true. an ebook. <laughs> that's true. I've added to it over the years. So, um, yeah, it's a really great package, actually. So my high flyer email goes out every week. But I also have this free email series within it, the six steps to building a profitable business, some of which we talked about today, and some of which is covered in the BYOB workshops. Um, but in the kit, they get a social media workout for entrepreneurs because obviously social media is just so critical. But it really takes you through, like, how do you use these tools to build authority and credibility and gain more business? They also get um, a manifesto of my business lessons learned, which is more inspiring than anything, but some really great nuggets in there. Um, they get an audio of what it takes to be free. So that's more just talking about, yeah, the areas that you can work on to build a business in life that you love. And they also get, which has just been fully updated, a checklist of tools to run your business from any. So some of my favorite tools in the world to do that. And that's all contained in that suitcase data kit. Excellent. Now, what, what I love about your business is that freedom, as you said at the very beginning of this interview, was one of your top values. And I love how it completely permeates all aspects of your business and your lifestyle. How How is it that you got clear on the fact that freedom was so important to you and figured out how to make that happen in your life? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so glad it comes across because it certainly is my highest value. So how did I go about figuring that out? I think it's actually always probably been really apparent. Hmm. I just was reading an article in the British Airways magazine on the plane last night that was talking about millennials and how millennials don't like to be told what to do. They like to collaborate and build stuff, and I've never liked being told what to do. <laughs> the corporate jobs that I were in, even though I enjoyed them and I learned a lot and I built my skills, I just couldn't stand the fact that I had to be in the office from 9 to 5. It just seemed so stupid to me. Like if I wanted to work longer or later or work when I wanted from where I wanted, I just didn't have any of that freedom. So I think it's really became kind of this necessity that I've rebelled against. Um, and ever since I was a kid, I've been one to like just enjoy being able to go off and do my own thing, do handstands wherever I wanted, all those cool things. And so it just became, I think I just did a lot of soul searching actually and digging deep into what did I enjoy most and how did I want to live my life. I've never really wanted for much. Um, I love the simple things in life. I am the kind of person who stops and smells the roses. I don't need much stuff. And so living in a suitcase just made that minimal life really easy. It didn't allow me to buy any crap or collect stuff for the sake of it. And from there, it's just kind of permeated, as you said, everything in my business, running it lean and mean, doing all those good things. Hmm, I love that. I love that. I love how you're so clear on what your top values are and, and how you've actually made your life style um, fit around that. So it's very admirable. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we sign off, I wanted to I wanted to get you to talk a little bit about your podcast, because as I said, it was my inspiration for starting my own podcast. It's a pod the podcast that I always go back and listen to, listen to every single episode, always look forward to them coming out. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started with your podcast and, and who who you interview and what kinds of things you talk about? Right, I certainly will, and thanks so much for listening to all those podcasts. <laughs> so my podcast is obviously The Suitcase Entrepreneur. It's all fully branded, and I love interviewing um, every single week an entrepreneur who's not necessarily living the location of independent lifestyle, but has gone and chased their dreams and created a business around the life that they love. Uh, and so I just really love digging into their journey, the good things and the bad things that they did, and how they've really come out the other side of it. And so that's what I do every single week, week in, week out. And the fourth week is always me just sharing something, whether it's related to building business or lifestyle or mindset, the three kind of areas that I love. And it's grown and grown and grown. And I, it's a bit like yours, Holly, it's half an hour because I know that people are out running or commuting or 
off on their way and half an hour of just absolute gems and nuggets is great. I don't ever prepare for the interviews. I love being off the cuff and being just as curious about the people as as my listeners are. And I really just think it's just a craft like you. You've done an awesome job today, but just really understanding what you want to pull out of the person and how you can best share their story, but also make it totally useful and valuable to the listeners. And from there, as you know as well, people just start to spread the word because they love it or they get a lot out of it. You start to get more reviews, people commenting, and I just adore it. I get more feedback on my podcast than anything else that I do, probably by my book. So that just drives me to do bigger and better things with it, get even better guests, just continue to improve it in any way I can. And it's an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to people and, and learn from them. Mm, I totally agree, and I absolutely love my podcast. I always say it's one of my favorite parts of my business. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, what it's a really great business tool for those people listening. I honestly think it has sent me more business than anything else because for half an hour you're in somebody's head every single week. We're in their, you know, in their head talking to them. And if you're good at what you do and you have the right knowledge and skills, people then come across and go, oh, Natalie was talking about this, or I just really want to work with her, or I want to join her club, or because you're constantly building that authority and respect and trust. It's a fantastic tool. Hmm. Yes, I totally agree. So, Natalie, thank you so much for joining us today. Could you let us know where people can find you online? <laughs> I'm everywhere. I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, so they can be at my website, suitcaseentrepreneur.com. That'd be a great place to start. If they want to grab my suitcase starter kit, I'd be honored. Um, I'm also all over um, social media, but Facebook is also facebook.com forward slash suitcase entrepreneur. I'm Natalie Sisson on Instagram and Twitter and also on Facebook and Google Plus. So, and YouTube. My goodness, there you go. So all those good places. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to talk to you once again and, and to share you with my community because I'm constantly recommending you to people just because I love what you do, but you knew that already. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I so appreciate that. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening. And remember to visit sociallyholistic.com SHP 51 for the show notes on this episode. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Socially Holistic Podcast with your host, Holly Wharton. Please help us help more women in business by giving us a five-star review of this podcast. The more women who find out about this podcast, the more successful businesses there will be. So please leave a five-star review today over at iTunes. Thank you.